If it's Friday, Israel strikes back. We're following the fallout after the IDF launched what sources say was a limited attack inside Iran as Tehran downplays the aftermath and U.S. officials deny having any involvement. Plus, a full 12-person jury and all six alternates have now been seated in Trump's historic criminal hush money trial as the focus now turns to the scope of his potential testimony and cross-examination. And House Speaker Mike Johnson teams up with Democrats to advance emergency aid for Ukraine, but it could cost him his job as yet another Republican joins the effort to potentially oust him from leadership over the issue. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We begin today with an international effort to de-escalate boiling tensions in the Mideast after Israel carried out strikes overnight in response to that massive Iranian aerial attack less than a week ago. Now, sources familiar with the situation tell NBC News last night Israel launched what was described as a limited strike inside Iran and that Israel is currently assessing its effectiveness and the resulting damage. Iranian state media reports the country's air defenses were engaged in several provinces, claiming three small drones were shot down in central Iran, which is also home to Iranian military bases and nuclear facilities. For days, the Biden administration had been urging Israel to show restraint as it considered its retaliatory options. And according to a separate source familiar with the matter, Israeli officials did notify the U.S. last night that their response was coming. But today, while meeting with G7 allies in Italy, Secretary of State Antony Blinken stressed that the U.S. was not involved. I'm not going to speak to that except to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Our focus has been on, of course, making sure that Israel can effectively defend itself, but also de-escalating tensions, uh, avoiding uh, conflict. Uh, And that remains our focus. Now, in a sign that all sides are indeed trying to de-escalate, Israel, Iran, and the U.S. are all remaining very tight-lipped about the incident. When approached by NBC News, both Prime Minister Netanyahu's office and the IDF would not confirm whether Israel was behind the strike in Iran. Meanwhile, Iranian state media continues to downplay the impact of last night's attack. And here in Washington, the Biden administration is facing questions about its silence following those strikes. Take a listen to what White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre had to say at today's briefing. Why is it that you don't have any comment at this time? It's been several hours since the reported strike. Uh, Certainly that's enough time for the administration to investigate and come up with something to say. I'm not going to speak or speculate about any of the reports that are out there. I'm not going to comment and I'm just going to leave it there. Is it part of your strategy to de-escalate? Look, I'm going to, again, be super mindful. And I, I get the interest, obviously. I understand the interest. And uh, and going to be disappointing many people here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I just don't have anything to share. Good efforts by my colleagues there at the White House. Joining me now is NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez in Tel Aviv. And NBC's Monica Alba is outside the White House. Raf, let me start with you in Tel Aviv. What has been the reaction where you are and what has been the broader reaction within the region? Well, Kristen, it has been some 20 hours now since that strike in western Iran, and it is very striking. Both Iran and Israel really trying to downplay what happens this morning. We heard from the Iranian president, Ibrahim Rahisi, earlier today. This man is a hardliner. He's one of the Iranian officials who said earlier in the week that any Israeli attack would be met with immediate and massive retaliation. And yet, Kristen, when he gave that speech, He said nothing at all about today's strike. Iranian state media very much trying to project an image of calm. And here in Israel, as you mentioned, the official line is the government is neither confirming nor denying responsibility. We have not heard from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We're not expecting to. And this seems to be a public messaging strategy that is designed to give Iran an off-ramp. It is designed to allow them to choose not to retaliate 
without being seen to lose face. In terms of what we know about the strike itself, it happened at around 4 a.m. local time. The main target appears to have been an Iranian military base near the city of Isfahan, a source familiar telling me this was a limited strike. The Israelis spent several hours afterwards assessing the damage. What we do not know at this point, Kristen, is whether this strike was carried out with surface-to-surface -surface missiles, whether it was Iran Israeli manned aircraft, or whether it was drones. But as you said, U.S. and Israeli officials very tight-lipped at this time. Kristen. Well, it is so extraordinary, Raf, that you are basically getting the same reaction from officials around the globe as it relates to this incident. But it just speaks to how delicate this moment is. How much concern is there that one false move, one statement in the wrong direction could turn this into an escalation? Well, I think that's exactly right. That is why we are seeing such discipline from both the Biden administration and the Israeli government. Nobody wants to be seen to be goading Iran. Nobody wants to be seen to be crowing about any of this. What's very noticeable, very striking, Kristen, is here in Israel, the military has not imposed any new restrictions on the civilian population. That appears to be an indication that the Israeli government assesses, at least for now, that Iranian retaliation is not imminent. We are now into Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath here in Israel. We're a couple of days from Passover. It has been quiet. It has been calm here on the streets of Tel Aviv. And it's very striking. You compare it to last Saturday when that wave of Iranian missiles and drones were on their way. The Israeli military was on television almost every hour updating the public. And there were restrictions. Schools were closed and people were told not to gather. That is not happening right now. Chris. Striking disparity, Raf. Thank you for bringing us that from on the ground there in Tel Aviv. Monica, let me turn to you. What do you know what are your sources telling you about the conversations between uh, U.S. officials and their counterparts? What's the message privately that's being conveyed? Well, we know, Kristen, that they are in near constant touch on a range of issues. But when it comes specifically to this response from Israel to Iran, really the administration across all agencies is being incredibly tight-lipped. And that is intentional. That is by design. And that is in part to ensure that any kind of temperature here doesn't get further inflamed. It's trying to bring down any of these tensions. And the president has been clear throughout his conversations with Prime Minister Mr. Netanyahu about a week ago that the U.S. stands with Israel and its right to defend itself, and he has called that kind of support ironclad. But when it comes to warnings about a wider war or this becoming a broader conflict, the U.S. has been consistent in saying they want to do everything they can to avoid that. And Secretary Blinken was very clear earlier today in saying the U.S. had no role in this reported response, and we knew that going into that the president had even telegraphed that to Prime Minister Netanyahu in their most recent conversation saying if you decide to go ahead and respond to Iran, the U.S. will not be a part of it. But also during that conversation, Kristen, the president had said to him, you should think very carefully and very critically about your next steps here. And it does not appear that Israel heeded that warning, instead deciding to go their own route here. So this is another example in this already fraught relationship throughout the course of this six-month-long war where the U.S stands by Israel, but it's not like Israel is necessarily listening to everything that the U.S. is saying from an advice standpoint, even though the White House is quick to always say that it is not their responsibility to tell Israel how to make its own military decisions. Kristen. You're right to point that out, Monica, the relationship between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu that seems to be growing increasingly tense is a significant part of this story. Let me ask you about another aspect that I know you've been watching on Capitol Hill, all of the action there, these bills moving forward that would provide aid to Israel, to Taiwan, and also to Ukraine. Of course, they have been held up for months. Seems like they could get a vote as early as tomorrow. What are your White House sources telling you as they watch the action on the Hill? Well, privately, they really did 
breathe a sigh of relief today after that procedural hurdle was cleared and the fact that it looks like this could happen to them is very good news. They have been pushing for this in different formats for weeks and months, as you just said, and really they've been stressing the urgency for Ukraine in terms of the battlefield needs, but also for Israel because of what we saw just a week or so ago in terms of having to mount that defense after Iran did launch all of those drones and missiles. The money that is basically in this package that would go to Israel would replenish that Iron Dome defense system and other air defense capabilities directly. So they see a specific need and connection for that. And then these other national security priorities, the president has been talking about them for so long. Remember, they wanted to put these all together in what's known as a supplemental funding package. Mm -hmm. But the fact that now it seems they're going to move separately, at least the president and the White House encouraged if this does get across the finish line, he fully intends to sign it. Kristen. All right. Fantastic reporting as always. Monica Alba, great to see you on this Friday. Thank you. I now want to bring in two experts, Bilal Saab, a former Defense Department Middle East Security Advisor, now an Associate Fellow at Chatham House, and Aaron David Miller, a longtime State Department Advisor on Arab-Israeli issues, now Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thanks to both of you for being here. I really appreciate it. Aaron, let me start with you and get your reaction to what happened overnight, these strikes by Israel that are now being called limited and officials from Israel to the United States very tight-lipped this morning. What do you make of it? You know, last night uh, on TV, uh, it seemed to me we were on the cusp of World War III mm. and morning nobody's talking about it. <clears throat> and I think it's symptomatic of the extraordinary um, yin and yang that we've seen over the course of the last, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 days. I mean, you could have gone two ways on this. You could have escalated into the war that nobody wants. Uh, or alternatively, Israel and Iran could have engaged in some pretty kinetic signaling and messaging mm. about the do's and don'ts uh, that may or may not govern their behavior going forward. And you ended up with two responses that avoided climbing up the escalatory ladder. But I, I'd only add one additional point. Um, you know, like like Dorothy said to Toto in The Wizard of Oz, we really aren't in Kansas anymore. Mm. A new threshold has been crossed here. Direct strikes by each party on the other's territory. And the only question I would ask, I don't have an answer, is whether or not those new thresholds are gonna lead to risk aversion on the part of Israel or Iran, or risk readiness as we go forward, because the Israeli-Iranian relationship it isn't going away, and it's going to get increasingly competitive. Well, it's a fascinating question, Bilal. Let me put that to you. Do you have an answer to what Aaron has raised? And, and can you just characterize how tenuous is this moment? As Aaron was saying last night, it looked like we could be on the verge of World War III, and now, obviously, it seems like we've pulled back from the brink. Yeah, thanks, Aaron, for lobbing a very difficult question. Uh, it's good to be with you. Um, look, he's right. Uncharted territory. It's a new normal. Um, used to be uh, what we call a war in the shadows. Uh, indirect uh, Iranians through proxies. Uh, the Israelis going after Iranian targets, but in the region, not in Iran proper. So the stakes are much higher now. The room for miscalculation, mis misperception is so much bigger. What we are seeing right now is two belligerents who seem to uh, want to rewrite the rules of engagement and very eager to reinforce their own deterrence, which paradoxically, uh, paradoxically, as they try to do that, they're inching closer to a war. So all mm. of a sudden deterrence, which is supposed to be a means to an end, and the end being avoiding war, it's becoming an end in itself. Mm. And it's incredibly a dangerous situation uh, we really got lucky over the past few days that we didn't end up with what Aaron was talking about. I mean, maybe not World War III, but at least a regional war. What do you make, Bilal, and then to Aaron, of the United States response, the fact that everyone is being very tight-lipped, but based on our sourcing, sending a pretty firm message behind the scenes that now is the time to de-escalate and I guess the concern, it's not just Iran, it's Iran's proxies as well that, that the United States is concerned about. Yeah, I'm not sure what's left, frankly, on that menu that we could mm. use. 
that toolkit to really try to, you know, de-escalate the situation, given the fact that, and Aaron will agree with this, we are not in control, okay? We have some leverage over the Israelis. We have a good channel of communication with the Israelis, but we do not control any of this. And so we publicly, privately communicated to the Israelis. And then there's also a different kind of deterrent that really has sort of reigned in the Israelis, which is the very strike of the Iranians. This was not an easy strike to defend against. I know it was a 99 percentile in terms of interception, but you, you cannot take that for granted next time around. So the Israelis saw that. And then, of course, you got to take into account American preferences. And so they ended up themselves de-escalating. But it still poses huge question marks next time around. What if the Israelis next week or next month conduct a similar attack in Damascus, take out Iranian Syrian personnel, and then the Iranians do the exact same thing, and then we end up with the same vicious cycle. Mm. Um, we cannot guarantee the next time around we're going to we're going to be this lucky. Well, Aaron, what about that? And this idea, as Bilal says, that the United States just isn't in control. President Biden urged Prime Minister Netanyahu take the win after Iran had lobbed those drones, and and hundreds of them had been intercepted by Israel and by the United States. It is clear that Prime Minister Netanyahu in this moment, but in others, is not listening to President Biden, who's also urged him to come up with a plan to mitigate civilian deaths in Gaza. You know, Chris and, and Bilal is so right. Um, we aren't in control. Uh, six months, uh, we're soon going to be in the seventh month of the Israeli-Gaza war. And frankly, if you ask me how it's going to, how it's going to end, I couldn't tell you. Mm. Uh, American influence when parties, whether it's Israel, Hamas, or Iran and Israel, when parties are locked into a conflict that they believe is vital to their national interests, even existential in nature, the um, influence of outside parties, even Israel's closest ally, is limited. And Bilal knows the Middle East is littered with the remains of great powers who believe they could impose their schemes, their dreams, their ambitions on smaller ones. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just doesn't add up. I think containment here and managing, if we're lucky, but Bilal raises a, a fascinating point. The next time the Israelis get into some sort of boo and decide to eliminate an IRGC commander, mm. the question is whether or not Iran and Israel both would now believe that they got away with it the first time and there wasn't World War III or a regional war. Maybe they can do it again. And this is, this is why I think the new reality creates in many respects, uh, unfortunately, uh, a greater propensity propensity to take risks rather than to uh, restrain themselves. Bilal, is there more that the United States can be doing to use its leverage over Israel to try to urge de-escalation in this moment? Obviously, there have been calls for aid uh, being conditioned on them providing a very clear plan to mitigate civilian deaths. And, and there are also calls to withhold weapons, which has not happened. Should, can the U.S. do more here? Well, can and should are two very different things, obviously. The can, yes, of course, they, but I don't really feel like, uh, as Aaron was just saying, when you're in a such a tense and highly uncertain environment where both sides, the Iranians and the Israelis, are looking at it from an existential point of view. I'm not sure how much U.S. influence can really play a uh, drastic uh, role in de-escalating here. Of course, uh, let's not compare what's going on in Gaza, where I feel like we might have a little bit more leverage mm. uh, with what's happening in the war dynamic between Iran and Israel, which is a whole lot more dangerous, obviously. On the latter, I believe our ability to influence the course of events is much more limited than what's happening in Gaza. But even then, Aaron will tell you, we're also still struggling massively. All right. Well, we really appreciate your insights at this critical moment in what we continue to follow in the Middle East. Thank you so much, Bilal Saab and Aaron David Miller. Really appreciate Thanks. it. And coming up, Trump on trial. We have the very latest developments on the legal debate over what a potential Trump cross-examination could look like. Plus, Speaker Mike Johnson gets a legislative win and at least one more enemy in the process. We'll explain and have the very latest on the threat against his job as it gains momentum in the House. Straight ahead, you're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. It has been another dramatic day in New York City court where a full jury is now seated in Donald Trump's hush money trial after the remaining alternate jurors were selected today. The judge just held what's known as a Sandoval hearing to discuss the scope of questions Mr. Trump could face if he decides to take the stand. That's a big if. He says he'll issue a ruling on the matter on Monday. Meanwhile, there were some really terrifying moments outside court today, shortly after the full jury was seated, when a man set himself on fire in a designated protest area. Now, the fire was extinguished, and police say the man was taken to the hospital where he is in critical condition. Police say the man had engaged in conspiracy theories. NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesuvian witnessed that ordeal. She joins me now from outside the courthouse in Manhattan. Also with me is Dan Horowitz, former assistant district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office. Yasmin, let me start with you. I am so sorry uh, that you have had such a traumatic day. What can you tell us about what you witnessed there outside the courthouse? It, it was shocking to say the least, um, Kristen. We're, we're learning some some about um, about this individual who set himself on fire just a couple of feet away from where I'm standing right now. Um, he was a young man um, in his mid-30s, lived in Florida, came up here in the last few days, they believe between April 13th um, and now, as he entered into the square, he had a backpack. He set his backpack down, uh, took some papers out of his backpack, threw them into the air. Mm. He then doused himself with some sort of flammable liquid and then used a lighter to light himself on fire. I was live on the air on um, MSNBC when it happened. Uh, the flames, Kristen, were 20, 25 feet mm. in the air. I, I tell you, as I stand 50 feet away from where he was, I couldn't tell if it was a human being and or it was a fire that had been started in the area that was cordoned off for protesters. And then I saw the silhouette of a human body and I re realized that it was a human being who had in fact set himself on fire. It was a couple of minutes before authorities, security personnel were able to reach him and help put that fire out. EMT came in. Uh, they have now taken him to a local area hospital and he is in critical condition. Um, on those papers that he threw up into the air, Kristen, were kind of wide ranging conspiracy theories, it seems. Not necessarily sure if that was part of the motivation as to why he did what he did today, but a really tragic, unbelievable, really shocking moment on a history making day here in downtown Manhattan. It's just devastating to hear you recount what happened. I do want to ask you about what happened inside the courtroom, Yasmin, before we turn to Dan. They did choose all 12 jurors. Uh, it was a challenging process, though, right? Uh, what can you tell us about the jurors? Who are these people who will decide Donald Trump's fate? It, it was a challenging process. I'm hearing, I heard a lot of emotion um, inside the courtroom today from especially the folks that were in the overflow room, many of our journalists that are in the overflow room, recounting to us and some of what we're getting in on our Google Doc that many of us are watching to see what takes place inside that courtroom is emotion from potential jurors, oftentimes people that had a moment to think about the gravity of this trial, maybe overnight, were sworn in yesterday, came back this morning and thought, I'm afraid for my identity being revealed. I have anxiety about the possibility of serving in a jury like this and not wanting to serve. It took a while to get to where we are, but we had a full Kristen jury impaneled, and we just heard from Judge Juan Mershon that, in fact, opening remarks will begin on Monday morning. It is going to be quite a day for all of us to be listening to those um, opening remarks. And we also got a glimpse, Chris, into what the case is going to look like from the people. Let me read for you a quote from one of the people's attorneys saying there is a particular need for the people to introduce evidence to assess the defendant's credibility and they intend to make witness credibility the centerpiece for the trial. And that is an argument for permitting the Sandoval evidence that coming out during the Sandoval hearing in which they lay out some of the evidence they're going to produce. If, in fact, Donald Trump tr decides to testify when it comes to that jury pool, Kristen, we're looking at um, 12 jurors in the actual jury box, seven men, five women, six alternates, five women, one man as well. Let me quickly, Kristen, take you through the makeup of these jurors. If I can, we got a sales worker, an investment banker, a corporate law attorney, 
security engineer, teacher, civil litigator, retired wealth manager, um, speech therapist, a product development manager. That is just within those 12 individuals that will serve in that jury box. And then amongst our alternates, we have a diversity of folks as well, from an asset manager to an audio professional um, to a contract specialist as well. So certainly folks that are going to be in that trial for the next six weeks or so, really the weight, it seems, of the world at times on their shoulders as they understand or come to grapple with the gravity of what is ahead for them. And they will be a part of history, Yasmin. Tremendous breakdown. Dan, let me turn to you. Can you pick up on something that Yasmin talked about, which is the raw emotion that some of these potential jurors had, one apparently breaking down into tears, talking about the anxiety, just saying that they were not able to go forward with being on the jury. How extraordinary is it to find 12 people who fit the bill to serve on the jury, and could there be an ongoing challenge? So I, I think to start, being a juror, you know, folks get a jury summons and they say, gosh, I really don't want to be on jury duty and do I really have to do it? But what happens in my experience is that people take jury duty very seriously when they're in that room and they get in that jury box and they get selected. They take their job very seriously, especially in a criminal case putting aside the fact that you've got a former president as defendant here, mm. people understand that they hold a determination that's central to somebody's life, whether they're going to get convicted, whether they're going to go to jail, and they take it very seriously. Whether it's Donald Trump, who's the defendant, or somebody who's charged in a murder, or whether it's an organized crime case. And so, sure, the, the additional pressure that a juror will face in a high profile case like this is is very challenging. And that's why the judge wisely set a, a large number of alternates, because it may very well be as the trial goes on that you're going to need to swap out jurors who can't serve, who can't who who are unable to go forward for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So th this is unusual in that sense. On the other hand, in New York, we are accustomed to high profile mm -hmm. cases with high profile individuals, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's John Gotti, whether, mm -hmm. whether it's Harvey Weinstein and so on. So so you've got, you know, a, a history here of courts dealing and juries dealing with high profile, high pressure cases that are criminal, civil and otherwise. Well, it's such an important point. What are you going to be watching for next week? Yasmin talked about the fact that it is now confirmed that opening arguments will get underway on Monday. Well, I think the openings are, are going to be fascinating because I, I think we all sort of know how the prosecutors are going to frame their case. It's an election interference case. Um, it's got the tawdry aspects of the, the porn stars and the payoffs, but it also has a cast of characters from the publisher of the National Enquirer mm -hmm. to Michael Cohen right into the White House with Hope Hicks. So you've got you've got a good cast of characters and a narrative there. I'm really interested in what are the defense lawyers going to say? Now, they're not obligated to give an opening statement under our law. The defendant has no burden of proof and isn't required to give an opening statement, isn't required to present any evidence whatsoever. But there's no question that they're going to give an opening statement. And the real trick is how quickly are they going to focus on Michael Cohen? And will they make the opening statements an opening statement that's both a defense for the criminal case and a political statement. Mm. If they veer off into politics, um, what will the judge do? But I think what you'll see from Donald Trump's lawyers is right out of the box that are going to write to what they perceive as the greatest vulnerability in the DA's case, which is Michael Cohen. I, I think that's that's what I'm going to be looking for. Well, that, I, I can tell you sources inside Trump's orbit certainly spend a lot of time raising questions about him as a witness. So uh, we will all be watching for that very closely. We know that there is going to be a hearing next week on potential gag order violations. Do you have any indication how the judge, Judge Merchon, might rule in that regard? No, but I think, you know, hi historically, whether it's Judge Merchon or other judges, they proceed cautiously with contempt issues. 
Now, there isn't any question that he's been very clear in his orders about what he expects from defendant Donald Trump. And the DA's office has been very clear that Donald Trump has repeatedly crossed the line. What does that mean out of the box? Will Judge Mershon hold Donald Trump in contempt and give him a sanction like a fine? I would say the likelihood of that is not high mm. out of the box. I think you start with a stern warning, um, with questions, why shouldn't I hold you in contempt, and make the president, make the ex-president feel the pressure that if he missteps again, that Mershon won't hesitate to impose a financial sanction, just like the judge in the civil fraud mm. trial did. Um, now, there's another interesting issue here, and you talked about it in your in your opening here and that's this the so-called sandoval here mm -hmm. now one of the things that the da wants to try to cross-examine donald trump about are the instances where he violated judge erguan's orders about court personnel and so to the extent that donald trump commits or violates the gag order or engages in disruptive conduct that the judge finds contemptuous will the prosecutor then be allowed to not only will there not only be a sanction but will the prosecutors be permitted to cross-examine donald trump if he testifies about the contempt that mm. he's he's conduct he's, he's engaged in during the course of the trial well we will stay in close touch with you because this trial is just getting underway. Dan Horowitz, we really appreciate your great insights. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Coming up next, we are live on Capitol Hill, where a bipartisan House vote on foreign aid has fueled more hard right discontent with Speaker Johnson intensifying threats to try to oust him from his job. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Welcome back. Turning to a very busy day on Capitol Hill, the House foreign aid package took another step toward President Biden's desk and Speaker Johnson's grip over his Republican conference and the Speaker's gavel has never been more tenuous. On the rare strength of Democratic votes, the House moved to advance debate on the Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan and aid bills earlier today. In fact, more Democrats backed the measure than Republicans. Speaker Johnson spoke about his strategy after the vote. Even though it's not the perfect legislation, it's not the legislation that we, were, we would write if Republicans were in charge of both the House, the Senate, and the White House, this is the best possible product that we can get under these circumstances uh, to take care of these really important obligations. And so we look forward to the vote tomorrow. Uh, we let, look forward to every member voting their conscience and, and their desire. And that is exactly how this process is supposed to work and how the House is supposed to operate. Now, as a result, the group of Republicans looking to oust the speaker grew to three today, with Arizona's Paul Gosar joining Marjorie Taylor Greene's effort to trigger a motion to vacate the chair. For Johnson to save his job, it may take Democratic support to bail him out. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is NBC's Ryan Nobles. He's been all over this story. Let's start with that piece of it. Ryan, just how much jeopardy is the speaker in? I think he's in quite a bit of jeopardy, uh, Kristen, uh, and I think the, the path forward for him uh, is bleak under any circumstances. Uh, you know, the issue for uh, Speaker Johnson is not that the vast majority of his conference supports him, and that's an absolute truth. You know, 220, maybe 219 uh, House Republicans are supportive of the Speaker, but it only takes a handful of them uh, to boot him from office. And, and that's what's complicated the situation for him, because if this motion to vacate becomes a privilege motion, which means that they actually have to vote on it, uh, there likely is enough Republicans to boot him out if every single Democrat joins them. So he'll have to need a handful of Democrats to cross party lines to either vote to table the motion or outright vote to keep him in the speakership. And that's a difficult proposition for him going forward because he essentially becomes uh, the leader of a coalition government at that point. Mm. And that's not something uh, that will inspire confidence with rank and file Republicans, particularly conservative Republicans. So uh, Speaker Johnson finds himself in a difficult position here. But it's also important to, to say, Kristen, when we talk about this and we talk about the decision that he has made, he's made a decision to govern. He's made a decision based on principle and he's made it clear that he's prepared to deal with those 
people's consequences. So whatever they may be, even though right now it doesn't look like a very positive outcome for Speaker Johnson, he seems comfortable with the path that he has chosen. Yeah, he says even if it costs him his job, they should get Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan aid passed. Let's talk about the Democrats. How are they viewing this? Because the difference, it seems to me, between Speaker Mike Johnson and former Speaker Kevin McCarthy is that Mike Johnson has reached across the aisle and formed relationships mm -hmm. with some Democrats who may, in fact, be willing to bail him out. Now, the optics, the practicality, as you say, gets very complicated if he's leading a coalition government. But is there a chance that Democrats bail him out? You know, I, I think you're absolutely right about that, Kristen. Uh, personalities matter, uh, especially in the halls of Congress. And the one thing about Mike Johnson is that he has no personal enemies. He may have political enemies, people that don't necessarily agree with him on policy, but as a human being, most people tend to like him. And so that at least opens the door for, uh, for the conversation for a handful of Democrats to say that they would be willing to risk the political capital uh, in order to save him. But I also think it's very important for us to keep in the back of our minds that that is no guarantee. Uh, you know, Democrats would be risking a lot by allowing a Republican speaker to continue on in the speakership. Yes, they're very happy with him that he was willing to bring this aid package to the floor. But there's a whole host of issues that are going to be in front of Congress after we get through this foreign aid package. Uh, there's the whole issue of funding the government uh, in the fall, the farm bill, the FAA reauthorization. And then don't forget, there's the certification of an election uh, in 2024. Mike Johnson would preside over all of that if Democrats Democrats allow him to continue to hold on to the gavel. So I, I think this is no guarantee. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you for your fantastic reporting and analysis. You and I have a busy weekend ahead, my friend. Thank you. For more on the latest on Capitol Hill, I'm joined now by Republican Congressman from New York, Mike Lawler. Congressman Lawler, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kristen. I want to pick up where I just left off with Ryan. Paul Gosar became the third House Republican to call for Speaker Johnson's ouster today. As of right now, as you and I have this conversation, do you think Speaker Johnson is in danger of losing his job? Uh, look, this is a decision for the entire House. Uh, we saw what happened in October when eight Republicans teamed up with 208 Democrats to remove Speaker McCarthy and throw the House into three and a half weeks of chaos uh, at a moment in which Israel was under attack. Uh, I think this is a decision that everyone in the House needs to take extremely seriously and put aside a partisan political game and look at what is happening. Speaker Johnson is making a decision, mm. the right decision, to put aid on the floor for our allies at a moment uh, in which they are under assault by our adversaries. China, Russia, and Iran are a grave threat to the free world. Uh, and he is doing the right thing, showing American resolve and leadership in this moment. And I think it's incumbent on the institution, Republicans and Democrats, uh, to look at it for what it is uh, and say, we're not going to participate in throwing our government into chaos. Democrats talk, talk a lot about preserving democracy. This is a moment for them to show that they're serious about that and not join in the effort with a few folks on the right to upend our government. So let me be very clear with you. I mean, if it takes Democrats to save Speaker Johnson, to save his speakership, are you comfortable with that? You would welcome Democrats bailing him out. It's not a function of Democrats bailing him out. It's a function of all of us doing the right thing by the American people. Uh, this is a, a very serious moment in our history. Uh, frankly, we are in the most precarious time since World War II. Uh, and I think, obviously, we are a very divided country. We're in a divided government. Republicans control the House. Democrats control the Senate and the White House. We need to find compromise and ways to work together. That's the only way major pieces of legislation are ever going to become law. Yeah. And it would take every Democrat agreeing Let's be clear about this. They would have to proactively agree with Paul Gozar and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Thomas Massey to remove Speaker Johnson. So 
That is a choice that they would proactively make. What I'm suggesting is they should make it clear they're not going to be party to this. Mm -hmm. We saw what happened in October when 208 mm -hmm. Democrats teamed up with Matt Gates. It was destructive. It didn't result in Democrats taking control of the House. Uh, and this will not result in Democrats taking control I, in the House. I, But it, what it will do is cause chaos, and that is something that all of us should be saying we're not going to be party to. And just to be very clear, of course, the ouster of Speaker McCarthy was an effort that was led by your fellow Republicans. I want to play some yep. of what your colleagues today said about the Speaker. Get your reaction on the other side. Take a listen. I definitely uh, sense that there's a souring. Um, you know, to Republican leadership, and not just in the House Freedom Caucus, um, with other people as well. So, um, you know, I think that the Speaker should take that seriously. Well, there's continued frustration with the fact that we're allowing the, uh, uh, frankly, allowing the House to be governed by Democrats. That frustration is continuing. When you hear that, Congressman, and, and this goes back to my first question, when you hear your fellow Republicans express frustration with the speaker do you think he could lose his job look obviously there's that possibility you have three people that have said they are uh, prepared to move forward with a motion to vacate uh, but what is comical about the comments uh, from my colleagues is that the reason the speaker's hand was weakened uh, in negotiations inclusive of negotiating border provisions Uh, is because of their conduct throughout this entire Congress, their inability to work as a team uh, and pass a rule. Uh, you know, Chip Roy is on the Rules Committee and voted against the rule in committee, has voted against the rule on the floor. Mm -hmm. Eli Crane voted to oust Speaker McCarthy. For, so for them to cast blame on Speaker Johnson or uh, Republicans uh, within the conference who want to govern uh, is comical. The reality is this, if they wanted border security, which I do, uh, I voted for H.R. 2, I voted for a C.R. with H.R. 2, mm -hmm. I introduced defending borders, defending democracies, which would reenact Title 42 and remain in Mexico while providing lethal aid uh, to our allies. None of them co-sponsored it. Uh, they have done everything they can to undermine our ability to uh, negotiate from mm -hmm. a position of strength. And that is why there's not border uh, security in this package. But we are in a, a situation where America must lead. We have an obligation as leader of the free world. And if we shirk in our responsibility to do that, there will be a new world order with China, Russia, and Iran at the helm. And that will be good for no one, least of all the United States of America. Well, Congressman, let me follow up with you on that very point. Of course, uh, the foreign aid package is heading to a vote tomorrow likely it seems like and, and that is as you just say because democrats supported the ability for that to move forward some of your fellow republicans your colleague bob good says there's currently a quote coalition government in the house what's your reaction to that and if it takes democratic votes to get ukraine and israel and taiwan aid passed are you comfortable with that Yes, look, we're in a divided government. Apparently, some of my colleagues have never been married before. You have to be willing to compromise. Uh, and the reality is Democrats control the Senate and the White House. We control the House. There's going to be a negotiation. What the Speaker has allowed for is up or down votes on each of the individual aid packages. Some of my Republican colleagues are going to vote no on Ukraine. I suspect there will be many Democrats voting no on Israel. Uh, and so everyone will be able to voice their opinion. Uh, and But that's what democracy is. That is what our constitutional republic allows. We're here to govern, to negotiate. It's not easy. We don't live in a dictatorship. Uh, but I'm proud of the fact, for instance, that two of my bills, the SHIP Act and the Iran-China Energy Sanctions Act, are part of this package targeting Iranian petroleum. $88 billion dollars in increased oil sales Since Joe Biden took office, that money is being used to fund Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and the terror attacks against Israel. This is the type of work we need to engage in. It requires bipartisanship and a willingness to compromise. And Congressman Lawler, very quickly, because we're out of time, are you concerned that if there is a fight over the speakership, it will be sending a message to voters that Republicans cannot govern? 
Look, I think it obviously undermines uh, our ability to, to get the job done here. Uh, but the issues are what they are. People are concerned about affordability. They're concerned about the border. They're concerned about crime. I'm not concerned about the impact on the elections because the reality is voters will have distinct choices in each of these districts. I know in my district, I'm running against Mondaire Jones, a radical progressive who believes in open borders, who called ICE agents racist, who wants to defund the police. So I'm not concerned about the consequences of this. This is more about our government. Uh, and the American people, all of us, Republicans and Democrats, have an obligation to govern. Let's pass the aid package tomorrow. Let's not allow for chaos and dysfunction to reign supreme over the House. Republicans and Democrats need to work together to put an end to it. All right, Congressman Lawler, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And we will have much more Meet the Press now after a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. As we mentioned, the effort to oust Speaker Mike Johnson is gaining steam, but Speaker Johnson is remaining defiant about the threat. Are you worried about your job? No, no, I don't worry. I just do my job. Is it time to call MTG's bluff and just put the motion to vacate on the floor? Look, we'll see what happens. I'm going to do my job. I'm not deterred by threats. Meanwhile, some GOP hardliners are standing by the speaker, not because they support his actions, but because they're worried about chaos being unleashed inside the House heading into November. Listen. I don't defend uh, the performance of the speaker. I don't defend the actions that have been taken, including today. I think this is a terrible mistake. However, that doesn't mean that I support what I would consider to be not the most prudent action right now. Uh, we're six months before an election. We've got a two or three vote margin. There's a far greater degree of uncertainty in that situation than there was uh, you know, back in September. Joining me now, Simone Sanders Townsend, former senior advisor to Vice President Harris and co-host of The Weekend, Weekends on MSNBC. And Lance Trover, Republican strategist and former spokesperson for Doug Burgum's presidential campaign. Thanks to both of you for being here on a very busy Friday. Lance, let's start with you and what is happening on Capitol Hill. Here we are again with a House speaker who's about to work across the aisle to get, in this case, Ukraine aid passed, aid to Israel, aid to Taiwan. What is your reality check when you read the tea leaves of what we're hearing from your fellow Republicans on Capitol Hill? Do you think his job's in serious danger? Well, I mean, obviously, that when you, because of the low threshold with the motion to vacate now, yeah, I mean, obviously it is in danger. Um, but I find it interesting with him, and I think the kind of how we got here just in the last week, I mean, I think he, this is a speaker who has evolved on the issue of Ukraine funding, uh, yeah. but he knew he needed backup, and so what did he do last week? He went to Mar-a-Lago, he got President Trump's backing to say, hey, I've got the support I need. He comes out on Monday and says, this is the path, it's pretty much where we are today, where we started earlier this week. And I also thought it was interesting yesterday with the President Trump's post on Truth Social where he said, you know, Ukraine's survival is important to the U.S. It was a little bit of a change that he said yesterday. And what he didn't say was he was against what the vote that is going on tomorrow. I think that gave the speaker a little bit more of the runway he needed to get this plane off the ground and some cover to the Republicans who are going to vote yes tomorrow. I think you're absolutely right. And Simone, it's so interesting because Trump had kind of torpedoed the process, mm -hmm. and then ultimately came around and said, okay, well, I can get behind it if it's in the form of a loan. Now part of it's in the form of a loan. The question is, would Democrats be on board? President Biden says, yes, just get the aid to Ukraine and we will back it. Do you expect in this case that Democrats are going to help him pass this tomorrow, but bail him out if necessary. Well, when it comes to the legislation, as uh, Democratic leader Jeffrey said just earlier today, their focus is getting these bills passed. And so Democrats are going to do what they need to do to work with Republicans to do their jobs, frankly. Now, I will note, we always talk about the foreign aid, and people forget that most of the aid goes to American companies to, yeah. well, really, the aid goes to the Pentagon, and then the Pentagon takes that money and it buys weapons that are made in America, in places like Kentucky, Ohio, Arizona, uh, Georgia, okay? So that's where the majority of the money is going. When it comes to saving Mike Johnson, I think it really depends on what Mike Johnson does over the weekend. I'm reminded of Speaker McCarthy, and Democrats, they were not going to, you know, they were not going to muck up the situation with Speaker McCarthy. They 
was like, look, he didn't do anything to us per se. We're fine. And then he went on the Sunday show. That's right. The Sunday before <laughs> and said the Democrats were a threat to democracy. And Democrats were like, that's good luck. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I, I don't think... It's a good reenactment it of, of, how, actually, it's a great, of yes. how it <laughs> went down. <laughs> because basically, Simone hits the nail on the head that there are some key differences between Speaker Johnson and former Speaker McCarthy and how they are going about building these relationships with Democrats and kind of the practicality of needing to work with them. Well, I, I'm not going to get into the debate between McCarthy and, and the <laughs> I, I don't. I, well, yeah, because I would just note that Mike Johnson, he, he actively participated in the insurrection and, and Donald Trump and the, the vote situation, whereas Speaker McCarthy, that was not his jam, for lack of a better term. So I, yeah. I don't think anyone really wants to relive what we did last fall with no speaker, particularly on the Republican side. But I even think a lot of Democrats don't want to go through this. It, it's not good yeah. for Congress. It's not good as a whole. It looks bad across the world. And so I really don't think, with the exception of these few individuals, I don't think anybody really wants to go through it. Well, we're talking about how Trump is kind of looming over this. Simone, let's talk about some new polling. He has been in court this week. What I thought was fascinating, his campaign said he's going to split time between the campaign trail in court. He was really just in court this mm -hmm. week. Now we have new battleground polling, which shows just how close this race is in a lot of different places. Tied in Wisconsin, tied in Pennsylvania, Trump up three in Michigan. He's got a more sizable lead when it comes to Georgia. What do you make of the fact that the polls are getting tighter? It's what Democrats have been saying is going to happen, but is it good enough yet? Look, I think the people forget that the last election was very close. We were in the middle of a pandemic and everybody was at home. And it it was a close election. This election is going to be even closer. So I expect this to happen. I think we should expect even more tightening and the polls vacillating between now and early September. And what you saw from, I think, the president today went to go speak to mm -hmm. IBEW, um, union workers, right? He feels right at home there. I think you're going to see him doing more of those kind of things in a lot of the polling that is coming out. Yes, there is abortion. There is Donald Trump is in court. But there's still this underlying think about how people feel about their financial situation and about the economy. And so I, that's why you've heard the president, I believe, talk a little more about housing. You know, that's forward looking. And it's like, I understand. And here's what we will do if you give me another opportunity. Well, it's a great point. And Lance, I mean, President Biden was out in Pennsylvania three different stops this sure. week alone talking about the economy. And again, Trump was in court. A lot of people expected him to straddle the line, to take his plane and get out onto the campaign trail at night. That didn't happen. To what extent are these trials actually becoming an X factor? Well, if I'm the Trump campaign, I don't actually hate this poll at all. He's leading and or tied in states that he lost last time. The fund underlying fundamentals, economy and immigration are still t testing very well for him. And that poll was taken from April 11th to the 16th, where all of the coverage from last late last week into early this week was about the trial. So again, if I'm them, I'm, I'm not unhappy with those numbers. Can I just know, I think we have not seen Donald Trump do these big rallies post um, coming out of court because rallies mm. cost money. I remember when I was on the Biden campaign and he was doing these presidential, vice presidential level rallies. It's 15 to $20,000 just per rally. Donald Trump doesn't have that kind of cash. All right, well, we will watch it all unfold. And of course, opening statements get underway in the Trump trial on Monday. So we'll see how it all plays out. Great conversation, happy Friday. That's Simone right. and Lance, thank you so much. Great to have you here. We will be back on Monday with more Meet the Press now. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press on your local NBC news station. I'll have an exclusive interview with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Plus, my sit down with Pulitzer Prize winning historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. Do not miss it. Plus, new poll numbers with Steve Granacki. The news continues with Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.